Are we streaming? Okay, we're streaming. Thank you to everyone who braved the weather. And for those of you who didn't, no judgment, that's fine. We honor your, your personal judgment, whether you come or not, that's fine. And thank you for joining us. I do have some announcements. February the 4th, we're having a church chili lunch. Speaking of chili, weather chili, sorry, bad dad joke. Uh, so chili lunch on February the 4th, we will have a variety of chilies and sides, so please everyone join, and I'm sure we'll have a sign-up sheet so you can let us know what you want to bring. Second announcement is the Lake de Grey trip. If you are planning on attending, there are 14 rooms left on reserve. And I am told that it is first come, first serve. And if you do not book by April the 30th, those reservations terminate and those rooms go back to the hotel. So if you're thinking about going, planning on going, go ahead and make your re reservation. So, anyone else have announcements? Okay, for the benefit of, of those streaming, Jack was announcing the Bible study at Jack and Stacy's house weekly, Tuesday nights. Be attentive for this Tuesday because it may have to be rescheduled. Do we have a little feedback? Or maybe that's just me. Okay, all right. <clears throat> I guess we should get started. I don't want to hold anyone up. I want everyone to be able to get home safely. Let me give you some let me give you some insight into something that happened to me recently. Last month I had the opportunity to take possession of items that belonged to my mother and I was very thankful to be able to do that. Um, I was really blessed. I mean, these were furniture items. There were antiques and heirlooms. There were, there were things that I remembered from a child that I hadn't seen in the longest time. And, and it was also a little emotional because my mom died 10 years ago. And for reasons that I don't need to get into, I was just able to take possession of these items. And it was also a little stressful, too, because it was a lot of work. And I will say this, for those of you who make fun of my little truck, it earned the truck classification. All the trips that we made back and forth, uh, it was a lot of work. And in going through my mom's items, I found a lot of these little hanging folders. And I didn't even know these existed. There was a hanging folder that had little notes and cards that I wrote as a little boy. There was a hanging folder that had letters that I wrote home when I was in the Army. And, and some of that stuff I just couldn't even read. I just I didn't want to read that stuff. Because you know, this was an emotional event really for me, and, and Lacey can tell you it was it was it wasn't easy, you know seeing a lot of these things because they did bring back a lot of memories and such. But then I found this one, and these were letters that my great-grandmother wrote to my mother. And I just brought some of them, but they were all laminated. 
And I'm like, my gosh, my mother kept these letters written to her from her grandmother and she laminated them. I'm like, these must have been very important to her. And I'd never, I didn't know these existed. And the other thing that struck me were the dates. These were letters written from 1969 to 1972. So I was one year old in 1969. And in kind of connecting the dots and reading through these letters, I became to understand that this was a very tumultuous period for my mom. And she was going through a lot, you know, with, with her relationship with my dad and him being away in the army. And it, this period of time covered their divorce. And there's a lot that I don't know about that period. I mean, I was so young. And you hear bits and pieces from either party. But when I was asked to give a message today, and I was just thinking about, well, you know, is there something that, that I've experienced recently or something that you know, I feel like the Lord is impressing upon me? The word nurturing came to me, and it's because of these letters, nurturing. And I just want to read some excerpts from these letters. I just think they're so cool. And my great-grandmother, she lived through a, just a wonderful time in our history, really. She was born in the late 1800s. She was an adult during the Great Depression you know, so she, she experienced World War One, World War Two, uh, the Vietnam War. She got to see, so a woman who was born in the 1800s got to see the moon landing on a television set. So you think about all the change going on in this world and in this country, and she was able to witness all that. Um, she went through a lot herself because her husband, and she grew up in Marthaville, a little town south of here, and her husband owned a little, little store. The town survived on the railroad line that would come through the town. And he had the little, little store that supplied that town. And he, he passed away when my great-grandmother was fairly young. And so she raised my grandmother as a single mom. And that must not have been very easy. And then she eventually moved up to Shreveport. So anyway... <clears throat> And there are some other things, too, that, that impressed upon me. This relationship being so important to my mother, having this nurturing grandmother in her life. And this, some of the things are just so funny, too. But So, like, here's, here's the first letter you know, from, that I picked out. And she's writing to my mom who's experience, experiencing loneliness. And she says, you know, don't get, don't get lonely or blue, you know, when you're alone. And uh, she says, when you get lonely, get busy at something. Create something. Feel, feel thankful for what you have. One can't have a thankful feeling and be lonely at the same time very long. Don't you know your grandma has had plenty of lonely, depressed feelings in her life? But I immediately started counting my blessings and get busy. My first thought is, I'm thankful I'm physically and mentally able to work at something. And boy, I get busy because you know I'm very contented. If we have peace of mind, we are missing the boat. It is up to us. You are my granddaughter, and you have some of my blood in your veins. So remember, don't waste one minute of your time being lonely or blue. If you aren't in the mood to do one thing, then try something else. Cook. Fix a drawer for our baby. That was me. Play with him. Take him outside. Do your best to always smile. And if you'll remember this, you will grow older with a contented mind, which is priceless and saves your nerves. <laughs> I just love this stuff. You know, here's another one. Um, she was writing about you know, her illness. My great-grandmother had cancer. Honey, I'm feeling better and the lump is gone. You know what I told you and you said, Grandmother, you don't believe that, do you? But I do, darling, and each morning I say a prayer for you all, and remember, don't try to live without God. If in the future you, 
if in the future, through the years, you and my aunt can be influenced towards being kind to those you love, thankful to the Lord for what you have, then my life will not have been spent in vain. End of sermon. <laughs> oh my goodness. Bless your heart, I had to laugh at you needing proof that Christ was born. Everything we know that happened, all the centuries before, we learned from history. And through the ages, God has given us miracles, things that seem impossible. When I lay on my bed and saw and heard the men walking and talking on the moon, I realized it's another miracle God is working through the minds of the scientists to let us know miracles are happening today. There isn't anything impossible with God. And billions of people through the last 2,000 years knew Christ was born. It's the most important record in history we have. People in the ages past have risked their lives to worship God as they pleased. Think of the pilgrims in that old wooden Mayflower crossing the Atlantic. Why they weren't all drowned at sea was a miracle of God. No, darling, all the best lawyers in the world wouldn't attempt to prove Christ wasn't born. All the money in the world couldn't pay them to try to prove it. And yet, if it had to be, they would certainly take the stand that He had been born for all the millions of people who had testified to the fact, including your old grandma. And He is here with us today in spirit. He speaks to us. When you get mad at little Bill <laughs> and want to slap him hard, and something inside of you says, don't. <clears throat> it's Christ speaking through your sister. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> it's those little wonderful things. Um, and then just the emphasis on living a simple life. You know, like I said, she grew up in a little town you know, during the Great Depression. And, you know, she wasn't poor. But there was a lot of poverty around them. And so she knew what it meant to live a simple life. The more we love, the more we can love, and it makes our life rich indeed. When we get to where the simple things of a life can't make us happy, we become poor indeed. As you get along today, be sure to catch each day's simple little pleasures and build them Big for the day. A pleasant word or making your baby laugh can come back to you double. And above all, keep a thankful thought in your mind for being able to see and enjoy the simple things each day that God has given us to enjoy and some people never see. Yes, darling, your grandmother is rich indeed. Not in material things, but in the simple things that really matter. And being able to love and hold the love of family and friends. And above all, knowing there is a supreme being. This wonderful world just didn't happen. It was created and planned for all to enjoy. And as we go along, I feel we must keep a thankful thought for any little nice thing that we have. And I feel if I can brighten, brighten somebody's life each day, my life will not have been spent in vain. Isn't that sweet? Just bear with me. I'm almost done. I couldn't live without my prayer life. It's the most wonderful thing in the world to be able to pray and believe your prayers are heard. If in any way my life has or can influence you, it's to live a life. It's to live worthwhile. <laughs> I'm having trouble even reading this. To influence you too. Okay, this is my mother and her sister. To influence you too to live worthwhile lives, then I haven't lived in vain. And that was so important to my great-grandmother. I mean, there, I, I'm not going to keep reading all these, but I'm going to go to this last one that I, that I picked out.
I've really no news. This was in 1972, so this was this was after the divorce. I was four years old. I've really no news, but get to reading about young widows, probably from the Vietnam War, and the blue lonely days they have before they get adjusted to making a new life for themselves and thought about you. I know you have days you feel everything is going wrong. We all have them. But it's bound to be more so with you. And this is to remind you for the 100th time, don't feel discouraged. Just know all will work out for you and know God will help you. Don't allow yourself to doubt that He won't take care of you. He will, I know. You see, darling, I was pretty young when I was left a widow, and God was all that carried me through. And I didn't have a grandmother to encourage, love, and pray for me. I didn't have parents to love and do for me. And don't you forget, your mom and dad would go to you at midnight if you needed them. Isn't that sweet? So nurturing love. So what is nurture? Well, the definition of nurture is to care for, to protect, to encourage. It's also to help, to develop. Nurturing can include providing emotional support. Now the caveat is that it needs to be respectful non-judgmental, and compassionate. It also includes showing appreciation, being attentive to others' needs, and lastly, expressing love and care with the caveat, unconditionally. Now, I was doing a little reading online, and please don't judge me. I like to research things out. That's just what I do. And I came across this book excerpt. The, top, the chapter title is entitled Nurturing Approach to Love from the book In the Name of Love, Romantic Ideology and Its Victims. I'm like, oh boy. But it seemed, it was interesting to me. And the author listed these principles of nurturing love. Self-validation. Okay. You are intrinsically or naturally approved, worthy, and valuable. Focus on doing intrinsically valuable activities. Focus on the activity itself, not the results. Like, for example, Lauren, our daughter Lauren, who's in town this weekend, we were, the three of us, we were shopping, and she made a comment in the car. She's like, you know what? I just love being with you, the three, the, the three of us, being together, even if we're just grocery shopping. I just love the experience. Now, the op an opposite example to that could be value linked to performance. Well, you know, I value you only if you accomplish these things or do these things. So that's an extrinsically linked value. No, we need to encourage and nurture others by pointing out their intrinsic value. Uniqueness is another principle. Isn't it wonderful that we're all unique? That we're not robots made on an assembly line and that we can encourage and validate and nurture each other's uniqueness. And this last one is functional harmony. Functional harmony. Harmony. That makes me think of a choir, okay? Harmony, harmony, harmony. Aha! All right, think of the different voice types in a choir. So there's four main voice types. There's soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. So functional harmony is when these unique types come together and then they create something wonderful. It's not a fusion of these types. No, 
each voice type has its own unique voice. And the beautiful sound is the blending of these unique voices, not the fusion of the voices. Does that make sense? So it's not like... Like, here's an example. So in Scripture, we know that you know when a husband and a wife get married, they become one. Okay, it's a metaphor. Lacey's flesh didn't get fused into my flesh. We're not some weird-looking creation because we got married. No, we are separate, but we are together. So it's a metaphor for the relationship. So God didn't fuse us together. He brought us together. So the emphasis on self-worth and uniqueness and development. And I know some of you may be thinking, Bill, where are you going with this? What is all this psychobabble? Just hang with me. I get it. I get it. And let me just say this. Um, there, here's some Bill opinion for you. I believe God and science can coexist. And I see science as an earthly dimensional understanding of God's earth creation. I mean, that's how I would explain the relationship between science and God. God created earth and He gave us through studying natural laws the ability to understand a dimension of His creation. Now, science obviously cannot explain the supernatural, but it's not supposed to. And some of you may be thinking, well, okay, nurturing, this sounds a little wimpy. Nurturing is a woman's job. Men don't need to care about nurturing. Baloney. You're wrong. If you have your Bible, open up to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her to make her holy. Or I guess you could say to sanctify. Cleansing her by the washing with water through the Word and to present her to Himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. After all, Oh, excuse me. I just skipped one verse. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one has ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. Hmm. So Paul is saying that you know, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. That sounds like nurturing. Sounds like nurturing. But now this phrase, as Christ loved the church, well, how did Christ or how does Christ love the church? How does He do that? If you had to summarize how Christ loves the church, what comes to mind? Unconditional. Absolutely. I think of the word sacrifice. So sacrifice and unconditional, because the sacrifice emanates from, so Jesus is sacrificing and He's doing so out of 
and I'm going to incorporate Nikki's word, unconditional love. So out of love, Jesus paid a great price, His own life, for something of great value. And that something of great value is you and me. Right? You tracking with me? Okay, let's now turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. So from these these parables, Jesus is telling us about the value of the kingdom of heaven. It's so precious that you would give everything for it. And in the case of this field, this parable, the person who found the treasure bought that whole field. What is a field? It's dirt. So the person who discovered the treasure in the dirt bought the dirt to possess the treasure. All right, you tracking? Similarly, you and I have valuable contents within each of us. So by his sacrifice, Jesus bought us. But he didn't just buy the treasure, he bought all of us. He didn't pick and choose, I want this part of Bill, but I don't want the other part of Bill. No. He paid the price, he sacrificed his life, to have all of me in you. And it is in this way that a husband should love his wife. I mean, what if I said to my wife, you know, Lacey, I love this part of you. I love the fact that, you know, you raise our kids so well. I love the fact you're a great cook and I love da-da-da-da-da. But you know what? The other parts of you, I I just... mm -mm. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. So in a relationship, especially in a marriage, we love all of that person that we are connected to. I'm sure everyone remembers the book and the movie The Shack. Okay, It was kind of controversial. I don't agree with the controversy, but it was a wonderful book and I love the movie. The author of the shack, William Paul Young, depicts God, the Father, as a large black woman. That was one of the biggest controversies of that book. In a 2008 interview, he was asked if he actually believed that God is a woman. And this is his answer, of course not. He explained that he was using imagery. He used the imagery to portray a nature or a quality of God. And 
this quality of God, this nurturing love, was desperately needed by the main character in the book, Mac. And it was because of Mac's father issues. So the main character, because of father issues, he needed nurturing love in his life to help him overcome the tragedy of his daughter being kidnapped and murdered. William Paul Young went on to say, I wanted to watch God build a bridge to Mac's heart that was bypassed, that bypassed the bias Mac had against God as Father. When I was looking for someone in Western culture who exhibited some of those nurturing, loving, in your face, but absolutely committed to you, unconditional kind of love, a large black African American woman fit. Let's look at how God nurtures in the lives of the Adams. And I'm not talking about the Adams family. So we have Adam, the first Adam, and then we have Jesus, the second Adam. Okay. And God has this relationship, a special relationship with both Adams. Do you agree? And you can turn, if you want to, to Genesis 1. Genesis 1, 27. So if we look at some of the nurturing qualities of love and how God nurtures the first Adam and the second Adam, I will use these categories. So God created, He created the first Adam. It was supernatural. Out of dust of the earth, breathed the breath of life into Him and created Him in the image and likeness of Himself. And then look at Jesus. Look at how God created Him. It was also supernatural. This immaculate conception, the Holy Spirit coming on a woman, Mary, to create the second Adam. So creation. And with that creation, there's this nurturing. You can also see the nurturing love expressed through how God blesses them. Because yes, in the account in Genesis, God blessed Adam. With Jesus, the second Adam, Jesus gets water baptized through John the Baptist. And what happens? Immediately after, the heavens open up, God's Spirit descends upon Jesus, and God spoke, this is My Son, whom I love, with Him I am well pleased. That sounds like a blessing to me. So, He creates, He blesses. Here's another aspect. Provision. That's nurturing. God provides. So with Adam in the garden, what does it say? Well, it says that God provided him food. And you know, working in the garden, and oh, let me take a step back. This blessing and this provision 
came before God asked a single thing of, of him, at least by the accounts we have in Scripture. God blessed Adam, he provided for Adam, and it was then, thereafter, that he gave Adam his first instruction. At least that's what we know by Scripture. He asked him to work the garden. Okay? So this requirement he puts on Adam is after he blessed and provided. And you know, I've got to say this. Working in the Garden of Eden, I would not describe that as work. I mean, come on. I mean, God puts you in this supernatural garden. God creates these trees and plants that, that sprout food for you to eat. It's not toil. It's not like what happened post-fall where, you know, just, you know, if you have a garden at home, Candace, you've got a garden at home, does it just supernaturally grow and produce? No. It'd be nice, but it's not that way. We have to sometimes toil. So it really wouldn't work. And then when he needed help, he said, I'm going to give you help. Created, blessed, provided. Oh, you need some help? I'm going to give you some help. Adam, first Adam, I'm going to give you a helper, Eve. Now what about Jesus? Jesus, I want you to go get 12 disciples. I would call that help. And you know, when they needed nurturing, don't you know, you know, Adam and God have this wonderful relationship in the garden, and I'm sure they talked about everything under the sun. And we can read about Jesus, during His ministry walking the earth, that there were many times when He would remove Himself from daily activities and He would go away by Himself. It's like He had to recharge the batteries. And so He would spend that time one-on-one -on -one in prayer talking to the Father, you know, help me. You know, what do I need to be doing? How, you know, how can I... Figure this out. What can I, who knows what was discussed? Look at when Jesus went to the wilderness. So the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days. And what happens upon completion? Angels come and tended to Jesus. So God the Father sent, He sent help. He's there to help. Now, Jesus Himself said that if He wanted to, He could call on the Father and have 12 legions of angels at His disposal if He wanted to. But He wouldn't have done that. He was totally reliant upon the Father to provide that help. We all need nurturing people in our lives. And not everyone has a spouse or a significant other. And even if you do, times and situations may dictate that you need to go outside of that relationship to get some nurturing help. Jesus Himself needed nurturing from others. And in His time of greatest anguish, which would have been in the Garden of Gethsemane right before His arrest, He asked the following of three disciples, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with Me. So here's Jesus asking his disciples, be there with me. I need help. That's Jesus. If Jesus needs nurturing help, we need nurturing help. 
So I do have some ideas. Like I said, not everyone is in a relationship, a husband and wife relationship, and sometimes we do need to go outside of that, even if we're in one. The obvious one is friends. Friendships. You know, having someone you could go to. And there's so many scriptures about friendships and the importance of having, you know, friends in your life. Another idea is mentors. I recently gave a speech on mentoring and the mentor protege relationship. If I were to ask you to give me some examples of mentors, you might say parents, teachers, sports coaches, employers. And my answer to that would be, well, yes and no. I mean, yes, each of those roles include aspects of mentoring. That is true. But they're not the same. And here's why. A mentor cannot make you do anything. They don't have authority. Here's another distinction. A mentor will not manipulate you. They are trustworthy and they are independent. So there are no conflicts of interest. And lastly, a mentor expects nothing in return. There are no hooks, as Brad likes to say, no hooks with a mentor. You might be thinking, well, you know, a counselor, you know, a counselor could fit that role. Well, maybe, maybe not. And I think that it depends on one word, money. If you go seek counseling and you are paying for a service, well, that payment is a hook. I mean, I know people who have gone to paid counselors, and this is not, a, not anything negative on paid counseling, not at all. But they go to paid counseling and they feel like they're on a hamster wheel. They're just going back and back and back and back and back. And at some point, you have to question, why am I even doing this? Well, from the standpoint of the counselor, they're getting paid, so there's no incentive for them to say, you don't need this anymore, right? I'm just saying. Think of an attorney. What's another word for an attorney? Counselor. Thank you. Thank you. I have a client who recently told me about having to hire an attorney for a business transaction. And he was asking me if I had some recommendations. And he said, you know, the, he, he named two attorneys that he's worked with in the past. And he says, I, I can't use them. They won't represent me because of conflicts of interest. So it wouldn't be right for an attorney to represent opposing parties. That would be an obvious conflict of interest. And in the legal profession, you cannot even hire an attorney, a different attorney, if they're in the same firm. So the firm, at the firm level, they have a, an obligation to turn you away because they don't want any conflicts of interest. Well, so the secular world gets that. In the secu secular world, fully discloses that conflict of interest. I would say this about mentoring. A mentor is more like a friend who has relevant expertise. You may have someone who you could go to, like let's say it's something work-related, and you want some a benefit of mentoring. Well, you would obviously go to someone who has experience and expertise, but if they are completely out of the chain of command, 
They are independent. There's no conflicts of interest. And it's wonderful. And then the last idea I have for you are grandparents. All right? Now I've just gone full circle. Grandparents. Grandparents can be awesome nurturers. Thank God for grandparents. You know, grandparents don't have parenting relation or responsibilities. They're full of wisdom. And I know my great-grandmother was full of wisdom that she used to nurture and love on my mother. And they have knowledge of their own child, the grandchild's parent. And that knowledge and understanding could be invaluable in mentoring a grandchild. My mother's mother had kind of a rocky relationship with my mother. They're both dead, so it doesn't matter. I can say that. But I had a special relationship with my grandmother. So that same woman who had difficulty with her daughter had no difficulty with me, her grandson. And I'm so thankful that I had that relationship. And I'm so thankful that my mother had that kind of relationship. I'll end with this. Nurturing is very important. Nurturing is a very important aspect or dimension of love. And God, as I demonstrated, is a nurturing God. And we need people in our lives who can do the same for us. And I pray that each of you have an opportunity to nurture others because you get blessed in blessing others. All right, well, let's pray. Lord, we just we give you thanks. We're so thankful. Thank you for showing us your love in the form of a man, Jesus. And thank you for the fullness of His love to include nurturing. Or thank you for everyone you put in our path who does that with us, for us. We bless them. We bless the nurturers. And Lord, open our eyes for opportunities to do the same for others. Lord, keep us safe as we go home. Look after us through these storms. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You know, and it is interesting that, you know, I just came across these, maybe for such a time as this. And it's wonderful that, you know, people did write things. That's something that I'm going to get on a soapbox here, but it's something that we miss out on in today's electronic age because we don't do this. And we're so busy, we don't have time to do a lot of that. They had plenty of time to write. And, you know, keeping letters, you know, were important to them. 
you know, we have scripture. Isn't it wonderful that, you know, we've got this book and these letters. They were, these were letters, largely. And they were written down and passed down from generation to generation. And we can take inspiration from letters. Maybe we all should start writing letters again. If we can rely on the U.S. Postal Service. <laughs>